Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. Travis Hoffman, our NDSU Extension Sheep Specialist, and we are having phase two or seminar two of our Preparing Your Ranch for Drought webinar series. A couple of things to keep in mind is that these webinars are being recorded. In fact, our first of the series is up at www.ag.ndsu.edu slash drought. A quick reminder that we will be using the chat uh, to discuss our ideas. And so if you have some input that you would like to share uh, with some of the panelists and participants, please put all panelists and participants. Another option is the all panelists, but we prefer that you share your thoughts with the whole team. And we will be gathering the questions and then asking them live. And please use the Q&A section of our webinar today. Just a quick reminder that our next webinar will be Thursday, February 25th on supplemental feeds and forage options. And we are joined by two of our most talented people at NDSU Extension. Uh, and so what we do know is that uh, there has been some precipitation and weather that has crossed and certainly we're hopefully we're past some of our colder temperatures here. Uh, but certainly there are places uh, where we are drier than we prefer in the state of North Dakota and consequently through our group of our North Dakota State University Extension. We're gonna be offering you discussion, uh, insight, and then some question and answer again on drought trigger dates and grazing strategies. So I'm welcoming Dr. Kevin Sedovic, our rangeland management specialist, and Dr. Miranda Meehan, our livestock environmental stewardship specialist. Team, the floor is yours, charge on. All right, well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome everybody. I'm going to start out with just a reminder of why we're here today and why we're visiting about drought. And so just a recap of our drought outlook, if you missed that discussion last week, is currently 91% of North Dakota is experiencing some level of drought, while 100% of the state is abnormally dry. This map here shows our current soil moisture, and this is for most of you that probably aren't is familiar with centimeters is zero to 40 inches. And we are at less than, or most of the state is at 2% or less than where, where we are at normally in a normal year. And so that's one of our big concerns as we go on this growing season is we don't have soil moisture to make up for our deficit in winter pre precipitation. And also um, if we are short in rain this spring, we don't have that soil moisture to help us along. And the perspective zooming out at the whole whole U.S. and where we're at in in things is, you know, much of the Western United States is experiencing drought currently, um, compared to past droughts to 2017, where that was really restricted to the Northern Great Plains. And so it's going to be critical as we move forward in the 2021 growing season that we're making we have a plan and are able to make decisions early, because we're not the only ones that are being faced with drought. So it's important to understand the value of looking at these trout, these drought trigger dates. And I, I know I showed this uh, at our webinar number one, looking at, at when our grasses grow and when moisture is critical to drive forage production. And we showed this last week, and I want to reiterate this week that it's really important for, for producers to understand that we grow 80% of our grass in the month of May and June. So moisture is critical at that time period. And if we don't get moisture in that period of May, June, we know we're gonna have a, a defi deficiency in forage production that given year. The second driver really is fall moisture. And when we think about 2020, uh, we came into the winter months in extreme drought, probably one of the worst droughts that I've seen in many years, in terms of fall moisture. That fall moisture drives how you're gonna, when your grass is gonna grow the next growing season and how much it's gonna grow in that month of May. So that, that tiller that occurs in that month of September, October is relied on for spring growth. And so if we get into a dry period like we saw in 2020, we know that tiller in many cases actually dies off. And so new growth has to occur from a tiller the following spring. Thus it does impact forage production in that month of May. So how do you know where you're at and what, what you can expect for forage production this spring. We have a few tools to help you with that. Um, in a 
was it last in 20, 2019, there was a publication re released. Um, many of the rangeland science or rangeland extension specialists within the Northern Great Plains were part of this effort, looking at critical dates or decision dates for, for making decisions related to drought. In that, we found that, that April through June precipitation, um, and more specifically, May through June precipitation, is critical for forage production within the northern part of the Great Plains, um, specifically North Dakota, South Dakota, and eastern Montana. And so what we developed at NDSU was using those dates that are critical in North Dakota, we developed a forage prediction calculator. And it's an Excel document. You can find it, access it at this link that appears on your screen is on our is on our drought web page. And so I'm going to step through how that works. So the first page you can see it's on the Excel. Um, there's a there's instructions where you can find your climate data for your site. We're looking at we want to pull the last 30 years of total precipitation and compare what we're experienced seeing to date for that for your location. And so then that helps you determine your risk or potential for receiving the rain needed in that time frame. And so from that, then you can either, if you have it, use your own precipitation data, but a lot of people don't. And so we can find the nearest climate station. I pulled up an example from Bismarck from last year. And so I, what I did is if I pasted the climate data from, we have the years, the past 30 years, we have April, oops, May, June, and then this is April and May together. And then the last column is, which you might not be able to see, is April through June. And then we have the average and the median for those time frames. And then I put 2020 down here as a reference. And so in 2020, Bismarck received, in April, they received 2.64 inches of precipitation which the average, if we look at, or the median for that April through June period is 5.5 or 5.59. And so what we can do then is we look at what's the potential for us to make, receive that, or receive the rain that we need in May through June, which would be that 5.559 inches. And so we look at that column of April or May and June added together and the highlighted ones are the number of times in the past 30 years that that's happened. And so in the last 30 years in April, or May and June together, we, we received more than 5.5 inches, 12 out of 30 times. So 40% of the time. So not too bad of odds and we still have some time to make a decision and, and how we wanna proceed. As we look, we get through May then, we. Looking at that, we the April and May total was 4.24 inches. And so we would need 3.99 inches, so almost four inches in June alone to achieve average um, precipitation and average forage growth. And looking at that column, um, you see that there, there's only seven highlighted. So seven times in the last 30, 30 years in June, we received almost four or 3.99 inches in Bismarck. And so that's a 23% chance that you're going to receive enough rain in June to achieve normal forage production. Obviously, we know there's other factors that play into this. And so here's a summary for 2020. And using that calculator, Bismarck received 60% of normal rain during that, period, that April through June period in 2020. However, if you pull up the maps from GrassCast, which is another forage prediction tool, that it was developed by ARS and is housed at University of Nebraska Lincoln. The, the links in the bottom picture here for you. Anyone that's interested in looking that up. Um, and so this is the end of the 2020 growing season um, on the map here, and it gives you a percent of normal or percent of forage norm, of forage pr production. Or if so, the red is. We have less, we have 30% decrease in forage production compared to normal. And we go all the way to the blue, which is a, a 30 additional or 30% more. And so you look at the map for North Dakota, it doesn't, it's not all that bad, even though a lot of our areas were short on for our precipitation because we had so much soil moisture in 20, the fall of 2019. So that residual soil moisture really helped us out in terms of forage production in 2020. And here we have, a, you can zoom in to county 
county level. So I, I zoomed in here to Burley County and see Bismarck. And so actually our, our calculator aligned pretty well with what we've seen in the, the production estimate for Bismarck area, which was that decrease of 30% of our more in forage production. So these are just some tools to kind of help you gauge where you're at as you go through, as we progress through that growing season. Another thing we, we need to think about as we prepare is water availability. Um, so this is from our 2017 drought, a map of, of just available water, surface water at the peak of our drought toward that, which was July 31st. You see, that's a really big concern as a lot of ranchers do, do, do depend on surface water as a source for livestock water. And another thing as we continue is that we know as our surface water becomes depleted, the concentrations of our salts or mineral component becomes higher, increasing our risk for water quality issues. So this is some data from 2017. In 2017, NDSU Extension conducted 126 field screenings of water samples. Of those, 94 were submitted for additional laboratory analysis and 82 of them were found to be toxic. Um, the specific concern we see is high levels of total dissolved solids and high levels of sulfate. And so as we move forward through the growing or into the grazing period, we wanna be careful and monitor our water quality throughout that period. And there's some tools that we can use, including TDS meters and sulfate test strips to do a screening and then, and then see if additional laboratory analysis is needed. And Dr. Stuck and I will be discussing this further during water quality concerns and issues further during our March 4th webinar. The other thing is cyanobacteria poisoning and that potential. We've seen a lot of in, an increase in cyanobacterium poisoning cases in 2020. We've seen several of them across the state. And with our depleted surface waters, that's gonna increase the concentration of the nutrients in those waters. And as, as drought progresses, um, these blooms really do well in hot, dry conditions. So if you've had issues with them in the past, we really wanna be watching those waters closely. And the best way to screen for it is a visual assessment. Unfortunately, um, Laboratory analysis is really expensive unless you're just sending it to a lab to see if the talk, if the, the species that could be toxic are present or not. And it, and cyanobacteria blooms do progress quickly. So in this photo, I was at this location the day before, no bloom. Next day we went out and this is what we see. And so it's really important that we're watching those water locations closely. So what Miranda and I are going to do is we're going to go through a series of drought trigger dates. And we'll start with the April 15 to April 30 period. And so if we, if we get into a drought and we maintain these drought conditions during these trigger dates, here's what you should be looking at to do to, to be prepared for these for, for management strategies and what you should look at in terms of, of, of really things to watch for and how to manage your operation to some degree. So Miranda talked about screening water quality. You're going to think about screening water quality, whether it's a dugout, whether it's your tanks, whether it's a slough, whatever you're using for water, always think about the quality of that water as we progress throughout the grazing season. When we look at, at droughts falling into the month of April, and because of what happened last fall, we know we're going to probably have an expected delay in terms of grass growth in that month of May. So already be prepared today to look at delayed pasture turnout as a function of not enough grass to be available for one, and two, the grasses probably won't be ready in terms of phenological to, to stand the grazing pressure. Uh, next, and something you should really be looking at today, we'll talk about it in April as well, but look for hay if you need to be purchasing hay, if you're short in terms of supplemental feeds, think of what you're gonna use to feed that cow herd and try and lay them in at a price or a time period that's most economical. I can just tell you now, as we look at hay prices in the next month or two, I can see hay prices continue to go up. So if you know you're gonna have shortages in hay, whether it's on the front side this spring or in the back side next fall, look for opportunities to buy hay at a cheaper price right now. And lastly, evaluate your stand of quality winter cereals and alfalfa. Um, most of our producers rely on alfalfa as a forage base. And with this open winter with lim limited snow and this, this polar, whatever it's called, vortex we're going through right now, um, I, I would not be surprised if we see some winter kill happening on our alfalfa and as well as our winter cereals, especially if you have winter wheat 
Uh, winter triticale is probably a little better. Winter rye probably can take this, um, but just know you're gonna have to monitor your winter cereals as we get closer to the, to the growing season and see how they did in terms of performance if you're gonna use them for grazing or for haying. So just a reminder, a recap, but I know we've talked about this a lot across the state of North Dakota is that grazing readiness. And what does that look like as we're preparing to get to let animals out for to graze? And so it's really simple um, is to look at that phenol phenology of that grass plant or the stage of, of growth. Um, and simple as we're counting leaves on that plant. And so for our introduced species, specifically in North Dakota, we're thinking our bromes, crested wheatgrass, those planted species, we're looking at that three leaf stage. So three leaves are fully emerged and those plants are ready to be grazed that they're at a, a plant at a stage where they can, they can handle that stress and recover from that stress. Our native species need to be a little bit further along at that three and a half leaf stage. And that usually for those is gonna be late to May, early in a traditional year, early June. However, as Kevin had mentioned, we're gonna see it where we should expect a delay. I know Kevin talked about this and gave some really good examples last week. If you hadn't have a chance to watch that, I recommend going back. And he highlighted some different years across in North Dakota in which we had dry falls and what happened in terms of forage production. So this is an example. Um, in 2017, we did a grazing readiness, started a grazing readiness project monitoring it across the state. So we can give people an idea, a better idea of what, what that looked like and how it varies across the state and things that influence that. In Oliver County, which is in our southwest portion of this, our south central southwest portion of the state, 101% of normal fall moisture in 2016. So going into that 2017 growing season, we were in a good spot. And our western wheatgrass reached the three and a half leaf stage on May 9th. So that's pretty early for western wheatgrass. However, when we came into 2017, we had that a drought in 2017 had a, a real dry fall. And so we were at 40% or 42% of normal for moisture, fall moisture in 2017. And some of our pastures, they had a, they received extra pressure because of the because of the drought. And so between the extra stress on those pastures and that and that lack of fall moisture, we see in a delay in grazing readiness. And so the same spot. It, in Oliver County in 2018, our western wheatgrass was only at the one and a half leaf stage on May 14th. So, so what are your what are your options? I, I, we've showed this data now for two weeks in a row, and, I, and I'm fairly comfortable and confident that we're going to come into 2021 grazing season with a delay in terms of range readiness, as well as probably forage production. So, what should you look at for options for grazing in that month of May? I mean, most producers are going to be running out of hay, they're going to be tired of feeding cows, we're going to have to do with those cows in that month of May. And so the, the one that we talk about right up front is you're going to continue to feed them either in a dry lot or in, in, a, in, a, in the calving pastures or even in, 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 in the pastures themselves that you're going to go on the pasture. So you're going to have to provide some supplementation, whether it's hay, uh, some form of food source to, to, fill their, to fill their rumens up at that month of May. What, if you have the opportunities to graze exotic grasses, so if you have crested wheatgrass, if you have smooth brome grass, um, even if you have some areas that are dominated with Kentucky bluegrass, these grasses reach grazing readiness, as Marina talked about earlier. In fact, crested wheatgrass tends to be ready by about the end of April, early May. So look at these opportunities to graze these domestic grasses early, and you're probably going to graze them a little longer. If you do have a crested wheatgrass field or you have a brome grass field, there are ways you can extend that grazing period by basically strip grazing these pastures or rotational graze these pastures. Most producers on the average will graze these as a season long spring pasture. But even if you just split that into two cells with one hot wire, you can rotate across that pasture um, to, to get you more efficiency in terms of harvest intake. So my example usually is if I'm gonna go out and graze by the first week of May, I'm gonna split it in half and I'm gonna graze that first week on pasture one, I'm gonna rotate into pasture two, one week later, I'm gonna graze in there for two weeks. Then I'm gonna come back to the first one and graze that fourth week. It gives you time for recovery for that crested and it'll give you more production that's available for the producer to graze longer into the season. It allows you to delay that turnout onto your native pastures. The other thing you can look at are annual winters, winter annuals for grazing in the spring. Now this is one of them tricky, 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 tricky options because that means you seeded this winter cereal in 2020. 
And so if you haven't seen it in 2020, it's not going to be available for those producers. For those who do have winter cereals in place, whether it's a winter rye, uh, a winter trade of kale, they're a really good option to look at in terms of grazing in that month of May. Um, many times we put those in place and the option we look at primarily is haying them, but it may be an area you need to put your cows ahead of time and use it for grazing. So I have an example here. Um, we did some work at Central Grasslands Research Extension Center in 2020 where we did graze uh, winter rye and winter trade of kale, and we grazed Willow Creek winter wheat and we do strip graze these pastures. It allows us to improve our harvest efficiency and carry us longer into that growing period. And so this is just a picture showing um, some cows on a winter rye field. And what we saw last year in 2020, and we were actually quite dry last year on our soils. And so the first column shows winter rye. You can see winter rye already produced about 1,200 pounds of biomass by May 8th, about 2,500 pounds by May 22nd and just under two ton an acre by June 1. You go to the far right side of the, of the graph, you'll see we got winter trade of kale. It grows very similar to winter rye. Um, doesn't give you quite the biomass of the winter rye, but it's another very productive grass compared to the rye. The caveat to winter trade of kale, it tends to be higher in nutritional quality. So in the middle one, we had Willow Creek winter wheat. And I, I was under the assumption that winter wheat would grow as fast as winter rye. And uh, I was wrong. It's a much slower growing winter cereal crop. And so you can see we reached peak production here of 1,700 pounds on June 1. And so that winter wheat, unless you really need to graze that in that month of May, it's probably gonna be a much better option for putting it up as hay in the mid to late June. So Kevin touched on this a little bit, that importance of making early decisions of knowing and purchasing hay. And this is why we're, we're having this, this discussion is, this is a map showing our major livestock producing areas, which is the dark green areas on the map. And then the light green areas on the map are minor livestock producing areas. And then the red hatch or the overlay is the parts of the US that are experiencing drought. And so currently approximately 45% of our cattle inventory in the US are within an area that's experiencing drought. So it's really gonna be important as we move forward that you're making decisions and purchasing those supplemental feeds early. So moving into May, it, as, if our drought continues, we're gonna expect at least a 20 to 40% reduction in forage, produ in forage redu production, um, probably greater because of that dry fall, but at minimum that 20 to 40%. And so we wanna start making those plans to implement stocking rate reductions and plan for a grazing shortage in the late summer so that it's, when we get to that point, it's easier to make those decisions and implement your plan. Um, we also, as we, we wanna inventory that carryover feed and determine if we, if we still need to purchase supplemental feed or hay and, and price that out. And then Kevin already touched on this a little bit, but now moving into some of those other grazing strategies, we're gonna look at grazing those tame pastures um, so that those planted pastures our post-contract CRP lands. And then as we, we wanna continue throughout this whole grazing period, screening that water quality um, so that we can, we can strategize and we can graze those pastures that we, we may have a shortage with water or we'll have water shortages issues. We can graze those earlier, um, but we also wanna screen if there's a toxicity issue so that we can bring in supplemental water, look at other other water, watering strategies and move those cattle if we have to, if the water is toxic. So we looked at that April period for trigger dates and now we, we, we're dry in April, we come into May and we're still dry. And so you're gonna, you're gonna implement that strategy of grazing those domestic grass pastures, uh, whether it's bluegrass, brome grass or crested wheatgrass and look at what you have for options. And that's what you're gonna do in that month of May to carry you into that June period. Native pastures tend to be more ready for grazing. It's important to understand that, that you know, our grasses are fairly resilient in the Northern Plains. They can take a one year hit pretty well. It's these repeated years. So there are producers who, who did suffer from drought in 2020. And if we get in 2021 and we're still dry, and now you have pastures you're gonna graze hard a second year, it's very difficult for those pastures to withstand that resiliency. So, so try and minimize that overgrazing on the same pasture that you did in 2020. So look at what you have for pastures. And this comes to what we call, we call range science as art and science of range management. And this is really the art side. You look at what you did in 2020 and you strategize what you had for pastures 
that you may have grazed a little lighter, you may not graze at all, and you bring those to the front of the table first. And that's where you're gonna start your grazing in 2020 in that month of May. So you don't repeat that overuse on that pasture, especially in the month of May when those grasses require and, and really, really use those carbohydrates effectively to grow throughout the rest of the growing season. <laughs> so, so let's go from May to June. Sorry, we're going to sit here and talk about ourselves at times. But um, so let's look at June. We're going to go from May to June. We have now this drought's carried us well over the month of June. And I'm just going to say now, and I hope I'm wrong, but if we get into a dry period of, that covers that month of May and June, just expect that we're going to have a low producing year. And you need to plan for the rest of that year what you're going to do in that month of June because we're not going to grow a whole lot more grass after that period, even if it rains all at once in the months of July and August. So we get into June, you know, based on the data that we've seen, you can expect a 35 to 65% loss of forage production. And that variability is really a function of what you did in 2020 and how healthy your grasses are coming into the next growing season. So make the plans to, to look at how you're going to reduce your stocking rates, whether you're going to reduce a full reduction in stocking rate, or you're going to reduce your grazing days uh, on the backside. Um, evaluate your annual forages. So, so Carl, Dr. Dr. Hoppy and I are going to talk about annual forage options next week. And so look at what you're going to plan for annual forage options to give you another feed source or a feed base for the rest of the growing season. And again, look at your water and it's going to be really critical. We get into June and we haven't had any rain. I can almost guarantee you that most of our water sources that are in dugouts and ponds are going to have some toxicity or some health issues. So screen them, know what you have to deal with, and look at the toxicities. If we also get into some of our crops, especially annual forages that we get into the month of July in particular, uh, we could see potential nitrate toxicity levels in some of these forages, especially forage oats, tends to be the one that gets looked at the most. But you may have to also look at testing your feeds to make sure you don't have nitric, nitric toxicity issues from that feed you're looking at feeding. And again, monitor your grazing utilization, and we, and we you know, it's just important to understand, we, even though we're resilient, these grasses can't take these back-to-back -back years of heavy use. So try and minimize the use of over 50 to 60% in back-to-back -back years, or you're gonna pay for that then, and not only in the next year of 2022, but you're probably gonna pay for that in 2023, and even 2024, if you're in the drier climates of Eastern Montana and the Western Dakotas. So when we talk in range management, we, we often talk about that take half, leave half rule. And I ask people what that means. And a lot of times people think it means taking half visually. So half of what's growing out there. But actually when we talk about take half, leave half, it's half of, half of the plant by weight. And so when we look at the structure of our plants, that's gonna look different for every plant we have. So knowing your grass species is so important as we move through these because that helps you better manage your resources and also it helps you better manage your livestock herd. But that's another conversation. Um, so when we look at our grasses, um, the on the on, let me just use my arrow. <laughs> so over here we have. So this is our 25, this is the 50% we wanna leave behind for that grass is to maintain that grass vigor health um, so that we can keep a healthy plant there. Um, we usually, as a rule of thumb, we say 25% is available for livestock consumption. The other 25% is gonna be lost through trampoline, wildlife use, senescence. There are ways we can improve that. I know Kevin's gonna talk about that later through grazing management strategies. But as a general rule of thumb, if we're just starting with, with a grazing plan, we wanna use, we estimate 25%. This is an image I pulled from University of Nebraska Lincoln on the other side here. And it shows our plant in, as it goes vegetative stage through to the reproductive stage and where the growing point is. And so this is really where this, this comes into play is we don't want to, we can't graze that plant past that growing point. And so when we graze earlier in the season, um, that growing point's lower, but as that plant moves through the growing season, that it, the growing point becomes elevated. As that growing point becomes elevated, we need to be careful at how heavy we're grazing these, these plants, because if we grow past that, we're not going to get the regrowth and be able to capture that extra forage production. And so that's where it becomes really important to be monitoring that utilization because we can capture extra growth in essence if we're able to get that regrowth on that plant. 
and hopefully that'll help with our resilience as we're moving through this drought. Um, and so we have a tool here, we call it the North Dakota Grazing Utilization Stick to help monitor grazing utilization. And you can purchase those on our website. Um, it, but on the side of it has a, a chart that shows that height to weight utilization. And so it, it shows the differences. So we have the percent height removed and the different species in the side there. And that percent height is varies depending on the species because of the structure of those different plants that some have greater, greater weight toward or more leaf toward the base versus other species. So for example, we have our Western wheatgrass and and at 70% height removal, we're at that 50% utilization. Whereas our Kentucky bluegrass is an 80% height removal that we're at that 50% utilization. So another reason that it's very important to know what species we're working with out there. So, so we're looking at drought planning critical dates. We'll move into the month of July. And, and hopefully we've gotten some rain in June, at least to get us some growth in here. We get in the month of July and we're still in the drought, you know, you're gonna expect at least 50% loss of production on, the, on these fields. You know, we talk about in the last month, talk about looking at stocking rates. You're gonna probably look at, at many options of destocking, whether it's, whether it's early weaning, whether it's looking at, at, at age, whether it's looking, whatever you're gonna look at, destocking is gonna be one of your implements. That you're gonna to have to put in strategy to get by this the 2021 season. Look at those annual forage that you may have planted Hopefully we've got enough moisture to get these annual forages up and start strategizing how you want to use those annual forages. Are you going to put them up for hay? Are you going to graze them? Um, it, most ranchers are always optimistic. We, we may take a hay crop off, hopefully some rain afterwards, get some regrowth, and then double use that annual forages for hay as well as residue grazing. As we continue, it, as also in July, we continue screening that water quality. Um, June and July are typically the months where we see the, the most issues with water quality. Um, so I think we need to expect those and be screening that. And it, as Kevin already mentioned, is that awareness of that potential for nitrate toxicity, especially in those an, annual cereals and, and cover crop species or any, for, any of those maybe drought stress crops that you're considering using as a feed source. And I know Kevin and Carl will be talking about both of those a little bit more next week and continue monitoring that utilization, inventory and purchase feed. So by the end of July, most people have already harvested the majority of their hay. And so you should have a good sense of where you're standing in terms of hay production and know where, how much you, you will be short going into the fall and plan accordingly. In August, then is we gonna, we're gonna expect a 70% reduction in forage production if our drought continues. Um, and so what we're gonna see is that the, if we if it continues, our plants are gonna to start to die early, or senesa die early. Um, what I remember is the 2002 drought, I was out in Western North Dakota, forage sampling. Um, I was working for Kevin as a high schooler then. And and we were, yes, out, we were out looking at plants and trying to do some plant ID and everything was dead. It all looked the same. And it was, it was a real challenge. And it was that 22, that drought that year in that part of the state, it just, everything died off early. And as that happens, we're going to expect lower feed quality and we need to consider supplementation options and in terms of protein and energy. And then continue screening that water quality, monitoring our grazing utilization so that we can, we're not hitting those pastures too hard two years in a row so that we can improve that resilience, give them time to recover because we don't know how long our drought could last. All right, so we're coming into our last month of our, where trigger dates play a role. And I talked about earlier in that one graph of growth curves that that month of September now is your really driver for what's gonna happen in 2022. Um, you're gonna assess all of your annual forages in terms of what you have available in terms of hay production, or in terms of grazing strategies on these annual forages. Inventory, we talked about inventory and your, your harvested feeds. You know, for us at the grassland station, I talked to my manager, we get to July 1, we put up most of our feed, we're gonna look at our annuals. We get to mid-July, we're gonna have a pretty good handle on how much hay we have, how much hay we're gonna need. And so I'm gonna start looking for, for laying in hay already in that month of September for 2022, uh, if I know I'm gonna have a shortage. So look at what you have in terms of inventory, and, and plan accordingly. 
estimate your forages for winter pasture. So as we go to the Western Dakotas and the Montana and Wyoming, you know, we see a lot of land that is actually set up for winter pasture. We call it stockpile grazing. Uh, look at what you have available for winter pastures and then look outside of that traditional realm of what you have for stockpile grazing and see what you have for residue grazing. See what all your options are for feeding these cows. Classic example was 2020. We had a lot of different opportunities to feed residue crops like corn residue, uh, oat residue. Use those effectively in a drought period to get the most out of them. It's gonna reduce your costs. And it's gonna be a great way to feed these animals at a cheaper rate. Again, we've seen this on every one of our months. Water quality is gonna be critical again and monitor degree of disappearance. We get into that month of September, we know we're gonna run out of feed. You gotta remember, if you start getting a low of feed, that means intake goes down. If intake goes down, livestock performance goes down. And so you have to be able to, to withstand that on that cattle side. Can you withstand some loss in performance on that late period? Most producers cannot. So monitor to see where you're at in terms of performance. So let's look at these residue options. Now, this is a picture I took on the grassland station from I believe December a couple months ago. And we grazed a lot of corn residue in 2020. It's a great resource to use. Uh, one thing you're gonna find with grazing corn residue is you will have a deficiency in protein. And so try and bring protein into the system to make that rumen function properly, to use those low quality feeds more effectively through the animal itself. So look at protein supplements. Um, you should have your calves off their side. Uh, it's just tough to put a lot of input costs to, to maintain a, a lactating cow and her calf. In terms of mineral deficiencies, when you're grazing on corn residue, the calcium phosphorus levels tend to be an issue. So always provide a good balanced diet that meets the minimum requirements as well as protein requirements. This is a picture I took probably two weeks later with cows grazing on, on oat residue. And you can see in this example, we took this oats off for hay. We got some fairly good regrowth from some lucky rains we got in August. And so we had some green tissue. This is a, a feed base that's very effective, very good quality feed for cows. Um, and so you know it's a cheap way to get by with consuming these types of forage base. And last is, is stored gray, gray, grasses. Especially get into the central part of North Dakota and South Dakota, we see a lot of brome grass fields that tend to be carried over. You get into the western part, you'll see even crested and brome. You can use these effectively as a feed source. Just make sure you wean your calves off their side because the, the protein uh, quality of these grasses is really low. And so just know it's a, it's a food source. Feed the rumen so they can, it, they can effectively take that up and use it in the rumen. And so I want to end with, with the part of the series is looking at grazing strategies. And this came up last, last week. You know, if you have a good grazing management strategy in place, you should be able to withstand a one-year drought. So when I talk about good grazing management, that means you graze in some type of strategy where your grasses are healthy, your soils are healthy, and they come into the season with good carryover growth. So you have a healthy environment for, that, for those plants to live in. And so installing a really good rotational grazing that creates deferment and recovery can create a, a, a plant community that would, that's resilient in terms of drought scenarios. You know, when we, when we saw in 2020, and we'll probably see this in 2021 if we see an extended drought, you know, you're gonna wanna minimize your overuse. So, so producers are gonna tend to overgraze one or two of their pastures. It's just gonna happen because they run out of feed. So minimize those to 20%. Don't overgraze everything. Try and minimize that to some smaller percent of your total land base. Then you can defer that piece of property the next year so it gets recovery in the spring, that critical period when your grasses start to come out of dormancy. So play that game a little bit to see get the most out of that. So you know you're gonna overgraze it, then plan for the next year for natural deferment to occur so you can keep those, those grasses healthy. Um, and overgrazing, like I talked about earlier, if you are gonna overgraze, you know you have to expect some lower cattle performances. Second strategy that you can look at using, and this is an example of one that we do at the grassland station, is creating rotational grazing with heterogeneity in mind. So we have multiple pastures, but in those pasture systems, one of those pastures may actually be rested or it may actually be lightly grazed to create a natural storage base or a stored grass base for late in the season. You can use it effectively if it's, a, if it's a normal growing season, you can come back and graze that in the fall, but it's kind of an, like an emergency bank. You know, you have these cells in place. And if I was living in Dickinson, North Dakota or Miles City, Montana, I would have one of these pastures always set in place that I have to deal with in terms of emergencies if I have a dry year. So it gives you that flexibility. It creates resiliency 
in your system, it also creates resiliency in your grasses. So the, it really works as a great option to, to, to save you in those dry years, and it will carry you into that second year even more effectively. And my third one here is we do, a lot of producers will stockpile some pastures for late in the season. And, and the beauty of those, those pastures is they give you a nice forage base. But what most people don't, don't, re, don't realize is you can actually cheat and graze that pasture in the month of, of June when we get our rains, the grasses are phenologically in the vegetative state. And if you get rains after you graze it in June, it will always regrow. And in, in, a, in a really, on a normal year, you almost get 100% recovery. In a wet year, you actually get more than 100% recovery. So if you read through here, what, what I try to do is looking at taking that winter pasture, bring it into the month of June as part of your grazing strategy, graze it at about 20 to 30%, usually no more than 30%, because that means you got more than one bite happening, then you actually can, can impact forage production for your winter time period. And know that it's gonna recovery when you get some of those rains in the month of June. We all know we're gonna get some rain in June, hopefully. And so they let recovery and give you some free grazing. I call it about two weeks of free grazing if you bring them into the system. And so we're gonna end with take home messages. So just to wrap things up, the most important thing, and we're gonna continue talking about this, we've been talking about it since October, Kevin and I with people, is develop your drought management strategies now, don't wait. Um, if precipitation's low in that May through mid-June, really you need to start implementing your drought plan. We don't wanna wait, we wanna make our decisions early um, because not just what's happening on your ranch is gonna impact things, but what's happening across the other states that are, are being impacted by drought is also gonna influence your decisions. Summer rains that in June, July, they're going to enhance that warm season grasses, but they're not going to add much new growth to our cool seasons in North Dakota where cool seasons dominant. Um, so we're only going to see maybe a 20% increase in growth on those. However, we'll see that green up and we've seen that this year. Um, we were pretty dry in the spring and I know we had we gave a few drought talks mm -hmm. and in July we started, especially in that north central part of the state, we got, we got some rain and things greened up and forage quality increased and we were in a pretty good spot. Fall drought is what you're going to have that low quality feed if we have a fall drought and those plants are going to become susceptible to low vig vigor because we're going to have that um, increased use. They're going to, the longer we go, the, the higher potential for overuse and that's going to stress those plants out. Um, and if we graze them too much, we, we might impact the, it's the growth and development in that next year. So we want to be careful about impacting that, that plant's ability to regrow in that following year. Kevin mentioned this a few times so that we, if we have another year of drought, um, we're going to see we're going to see changes to that plant community. Um, our our ecosystems are res, are resilient; they they're adapted to drought, but we don't see a two-year drought very often here. And so we're going to see changes in our plant communities and forage production is going to be dramatically reduced if we have another year of drought. Um, and so if we have that two-year drought. Even if you're, if you have a fantastic grazing management plan, you're still going to have to make adjustments. Um, and destocking and adding more land are going to be required to make to minimize long-term damage. And realistically, you're probably going to have to destock because adding additional land isn't isn't simple in this area. It's expensive and it's not a lot of it available unless you're able to use some of our um, our cropland resources for grazing. Limit that overuse to one or two pastures. And those pastures that are overused, make sure that you're allowing them adequate time to rest and recover. So allow deferment for grazing that next season. So as you repeat their increased plant vigor by delaying that spring turnout. And like I said earlier, I can almost guarantee you we're going to have a delay in terms of growth in the month of May. Monitor your grazing readiness uh, for key species. And we typically look at uh, western wheatgrass is common throughout the state throughout both our states of the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, you can use that species as a very good one to look at in terms of when it reaches grazing readiness. If you got crested wheatgrass, you look at crested wheatgrass fields or brome grass fields. Stock rate should not be greater than the carrying capacity. So on the average, you're trying to stock based on what you can carry. There's some years you're gonna be stocked higher than the carrying capacity. But like we said earlier, you're gonna defer those the next year to give them recovery time periods. If drought continues, early adjustments and stock rate are needed. And again, monitor use and, and some random, we put together the grazing stick. It's a great tool to use to monitor your utilization to see where you're at by the end of that season. You can end it.
just to wrap up, um, so we have, this is just our second of the series. Next week, we have Carl and Kevin talking about supplemental forage and feed options, and then we'll continue on with water quality and then herd management and reduction strategies and wrap up with a piece on managing your stress during these, during these times. And I will hand it back over to Travis for questions and answer or, or Q&A session. Great, thanks. We do have uh, some discussion and some questions for you. Uh, and I expect more for those panelists that we do have, and we have great participation to, uh, to join us and add some questions as well. The first one team is uh, if a body of water was affected uh, by cyanobacteria last year, will it be more susceptible this year or in the coming years? Yes, once you have cyanobacteria, so cyanobacteria is caused by ex excess nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus within your water. And unless you do take steps to mitigate the, uh, uh, the amount of nutrients in that water body, you're always gonna be at risk of having a cyanobacteria bloom on that, wadi, on that water body. And so we do have a publication on that. It talks about some of the strategies you can implement to reduce the risk, um, you know, excluding livestock from that pumping and pumping water from, it, from that into a tank so that they're not, they're not spending time in that water is one solution. Um, also buffers are a great, putting a buffer around that water body to help um, excess more nutrients from, from entering that water body is another good strategy to look at for long-term mitigation. Okay, thank you, Miranda. Um, one that's maybe just a little bit more exact and you kind of touched on it, but we'll, uh, we'll allow you to discuss it is with the dry conditions coming into the spring, if I'm unable to hold off on turning them out to grass and you touched on that, how will that affect a pasture if I grazed it for 14 days on a standard stocking rate and then left that and then came back 60 days later? And that's a good question. And I think that's probably more common than we think that it actually happens. Um, people need to get cattle out. And so if your, if your strategy is to go out normal time period and you're gonna graze for that 14 day period, the one thing you need to remember is also that, that the production at that time period is actually fairly short. So you may not even get 14 days, depending on how many animals you have and how long you want to graze that. But you can do that, and then you need at least at least the 60 days to recover that. And when you do recover, I'm not guaranteeing you're going to get back to normal, but you should get some regrowth and get some recovery. And then you want to monitor that second time period to come through it, that you don't overgraze it on that second period. So it's a strategy you can use. Just know your limitations that you're going to give up some biomass, and you're going to probably have to look at grazing it later on for less as hard as you normally would do because you gave up the biomass on the front side. And I would say another consideration if you're doing that is strategizing if you can use a pasture that has a higher amount of Kentucky bluegrass than maybe some of your other pastures because that's going to start growing earlier and so it's going to have a greater resilience and be able to recover a little faster. And that's also true if you have brome grass fields. We have a lot of brome grass invaded. Again, all of these presentations uh, are being recorded and will and are available at uh, www.ag.ndsu.edu slash drought. Um, one of the things, um, uh, Dr. Sedovic, when you were talking of the heterogeneous uh, pastures is what uh, do you do there at the, at the research center uh, relative to the water for those? Is there a centralized water and you just kind of have it pied out or um, where, what, what's the management strategy on that? Sure, so, and, and I'm gonna say, don't use my example as the way to do it, but we do have a central water source. And because we're doing experimental treatments in place, everything's replicated four times. So that's why it looks like it looks like. So we got this pie shaped with central water. So when you create your system, whenever you develop a system, you always develop your system based on water first. So look at your water development and then look at your fencing and how you're gonna lay that out. The heterogeneity was a, was a concept we thought about trying to create more diversity across the landscape, as well as creating opportunities for structures for birds and pollinators. We're trying to fit this whole gamut of ecosystem functions while, while producing livestock in the operation. The beauty that it does give us is it gives us flexibility and resiliency within the system. So in 2021, if, if we do get in a severe drought, I have a cell that was rested that I can graze in 2021 that has plenty of biomass on. And I've already strategized for 2021 to have one rested as well. So I, I'm not worried at all in 2022, unless we just don't lean away at all, I'm gonna have forage in place because of the resiliency I built into the system. 
um, to do that. And in the Northern Plains, especially getting to, the, to what I call the Coteau region, where, where moisture tends to not be as limited as the Western Dakotas, um, that rest in most cases, I would not actually have a full rest. I would have it grazed lightly, get some use out of it in that year. But that experiment is designed to create that rest. So that was a long answer for a question on water. The answer is yes, there's a center water point for those pastures. Dr. Meehan, where can people get uh, the applicable uh, grazing sticks to use? Are those something that we can make or uh, the county extension offices? Can you please explain how we can move to that next step? Yeah, so if you go on to our, oh, Lisa put it, is putting it in the chat for us, but if, if you go on to the NDSU website, the extension website, if you go under the livestock page and grazing, it, the resource is there and you actually, there's a publication that goes with it that shows you how to use it and you order, you can order one there. There, there's a price that, and then additional shipping and handling price that goes with that. Um, and because we were shipping them to Canada and that got expensive. <laughs> but yes, they're, they're available there. There's also a video to go with that shows you how to use them as well. Dr. Sedovic talked about uh, needing for supplemental hay. And I know that it'll be just one uh, more week from now of saying, hey, if, you're, if you are behind, uh, at least evaluate your inventory um, right now and then uh, across the way uh, as well. But I'm sure that we will touch on some of the uh, auctions or places that if we were to, to purchase uh, some products, uh, probably in next week's uh, as a transition with our supplemental feeds and, and feed options. And we also, um, I thank you, Miranda, relative to uh, the, the three state, the, the three leaf stages and, and uh, evaluating where those, those uh, grasses are when they come up. Um, so uh, are there any uh, last questions uh, for our audience? And in fact, again, what we've uh, been and is uh, Miranda, if there's anything in particular that you'd just like to summarize and transition us into the next, uh, right now we are caught up on our questions. Uh, for our drought webinar series on uh, session two. I think just a reminder of those, it really comes back to those basics of grazing management and, and keeping in mind you know, that the grazing readiness and waiting to graze until your plants can handle that stress. You know, looking for water availability, water quality, and building that rest and recovery into that system and monitoring utilization. And those are going to be the keys, um, regardless of what type of grazing system you have, or if you don't have one in place, the, those are the things we need to think about as we're moving into 2021. And hopefully, as we think about things long term, we can look at those long term strategies for addressing water shortages and getting a grazing plan in place to increase our resilience. Go ahead, Kevin. I was, gonna, I was just going to say, you know, I'm thinking about this, you know, we come into the spring dry and, and I think when it comes to one of the biggest things we produce in the Northern Plains for our cow herd is hay. And so if we're going to be dry in the month of May, you know, I can almost guarantee we're going to have a lower hay yield in 2021. We saw it actually in 2020 as well. And so for me, we already had the grassland station. We did lay in some about 150 bales last week preparing for this coming spring. And we're going to look at our strategies already this spring and early summer to be prepared to buy hay. I was able to, to buy alfalfa hay for 110 bucks a ton. It will not be 110 bucks a ton when you get to the month of April or May. So if you know you're going to be short of hay, and I, and I think we're, the, the signs definitely are there, we're going to have a lower hay yield and crop. Um, think about that today and not tomorrow. Other than that, I want to thank you all for participating today, and we enjoyed the, the question, and we sure enjoy the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.